figure out what the significance of these flags. All the members of the USGS? <laughs> Don't know. Well, good evening, and welcome to the United States Geological Survey Public Lecture. I'm Diane Garcia, and I work with Science Information Services, and I'm glad to see you all here tonight. Um, before I start on introductions of our speaker tonight, I just want to remind you that we will be having a November talk on November 30th, the last Thursday of the month and the last day of the month. And it's on um, sea otters, Confessions of a Keystone Carnivore. There are flyers at the back table, so please grab one so you can have it as a reminder. We'd love to see you there, here November 30th to hear Tim Tinker talk about sea or otters. Um, <laughs> but now what we're really here for is to <laughs> hear a talk on Global Trends in Mineral Commodity Supplies, and it's going to be presented by Dr. Stephen Fortier. Steve um, joined the U.S. Geological Survey in the role of Director, National Minerals Information Center in 2014. Steve came to USGS after 18 years in the private sector in industrial minerals mining and processing. Steve holds PhD and master's degrees in geological sciences from Brown University and a BA in geology and chemistry from the University of Maine, Farmington. His research interests from the early part of his career involved fundamental studies of mineral fluid interactions, as well as numerous collaborative studies involving stable isotope applications. He's also an inventor or co-inventor on four US patents. Um, during his many years in industry, his focus was on ground and precipitated carbonates, kaolin, fused silica, fused alumina, sintered mullate, and calcined bauxite. His experience with the commercial applications of these materials includes paper, performance minerals, ceramics, abrasives, refractories, and oil field minerals market segments. So the United States Geological Survey's public lecture is pleased to bring you a talk on mineral commodity supplies. And I'm going to ask, as always, that you please hold your questions until the end of the talk. But let's give a nice, warm applause and welcome to Steve. Thank you, Diane. And I'd like to thank also the uh, uh, organizers of the USGS uh, Public Lecture Series for inviting me to come to speak. It's always a pleasure uh, for me to come and talk about the work we do at the National Minerals Information Center. Um, uh, it's really surprising to me that um, uh, a lot of people, even within USGS, don't really know much about the National Minerals Information Center. Uh, and it has a reputation as being uh, one of the best kept secrets in the U.S. government. And, but I can assure you we are uh, working diligently to change that. Um, I'm going to talk today about global trends in mineral commodity supplies and, and why we think that's important. But I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about who the NMIC is and, and what we do and why we think it's important to kind of set the stage for that. So um, having spent uh, most of my career, uh, at least the last couple of decades, in the private sector, I still kind of think about the work we do in terms of a business model. And uh, one of the things I really like about NMIC is it has a very good business model in, in the sense that we have a, a very well-defined mission, we have a very well-defined product portfolio, a very well-defined customer base. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about each of those. Um, our focus is operational, uh, so it re we really are a mineral information, the mineral information function in the U.S. government. Uh, we are a production shop. We work on monthly, quarterly, and annual cycles, so our product cycles are coming out on a regular basis, uh, much the way you would in a, in, a, in a business. And I can say, I think, without fear of contradiction, that we consistently deliver results. It's one of the things we pride ourselves most on. Uh, our products are widely anticipated and, uh, and, and very well received and very widely used and cited. <clears throat> so a bit about the mission and some of the stakeholders that, de that uh, depend on us to deliver on that mission, we uh, have a very simple mission. It's to collect, analyze, and publish information on domestic and international supply and demand for non-fuel mineral and materials uh, essential to the U.S. economy and national security. Uh, 
Uh, and you'll see, I think, as we go through this, what that means in practice. Um, you know, we are um, the, the fact-based mineral information function in the U.S. government. We don't make policy. Uh, that's for others. Uh, so our objective is to provide the decision makers in the U.S. government the information they need to ensure that the U.S. has an adequate supply of minerals and materials to meet our needs. So, for example, uh, you see along the bottom there uh, some of the other government entities and organizations that depend on our work, the United States Senate and House, we get requests routinely from, uh, from Congress for briefings on, on a variety of issues uh, relating to, to mineral raw materials. We've just been asked by the U.S. Senate to provide a report by uh, spring of, of next year on uh, the USGS uh, perspective on the status for domestic mineral resource assessments in, uh, in the U.S. And, and, and recommendations about what we need to do going forward. So this will be a major focus of, of our work or in, in, in the coming months. But we've also worked directly for uh, uh, other government uh, entities such as the Office of the President, OSTP. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, we work directly with the Department of Defense, particularly the Defense Logistics Agency. I'll talk a bit more about stuff we do for them. And also the intelligence agencies uh, uh, are uh, consumers of our, our information as are the Departments of Energy, State Commerce, and also we provide information directly to organizations such as the Federal Reserve Board. Um, so you might not think of all of those uh, agencies when you think about the supply of mineral raw materials, but in fact, the mineral raw materials are so fundamental to everything we do uh, in our, and so fundamental to our standard of living that all of these other agencies have some component of their own missions that re require them to understand uh, the supply and demand of of uh, mineral commodities and whether there are risks to that supply uh, that could impact the interests of the United States. So uh, the scope of our um, uh, mission within the center is really quite broad. I think it's as broad or broader than any other comparable organization in the world. You see here in this periodic table the, uh, the commodities that we, recover, we cover in some way, shape, or form. So either as an element or a metal or a compound, mineral. Uh, so pretty much the bulk of the periodic table of commonly occurring uh, elements. We also have a very broad international coverage, and we are sometimes asked why we have such a global scope. I think some of the slides I will show you will point out why that's important. Um, we produce more than 700 publications annually uh, on, on the uh, cycles that I mentioned earlier. And we've got a c continuous record of mineral information going back, uh, particularly for domestic production in the United States, uh, to the year 1900. So we've been, uh, the, US, the NMIC or its uh, agency uh, predecessors have been doing this for more than 100 years. Uh, some of our publications will probably be familiar, at least to some of you. Probably the most uh, uh, prominent is the, are the mineral commodity summaries. This comes out every year at the end of January. It is the earliest year uh, look at the prior year uh, mineral industry production uh, and, and consumption uh, statistics available anywhere. is widely uh, anticipated and cited. Senator Murkowski and others in the Senate uh, routinely cite our publications uh, in, their, in their comments for the record in, in the U.S. Congress. But we also produce the Mineral Yearbook Series, Mineral uh, Industry Surveys, and, and Metal and Non-Metallic uh, Mineral Industry Indexes, as well as a number of special publications, uh, which is increasingly a focus of, uh, of our work. Um, uh, the, the analysis of piece of our mission is becoming more and more important as we, as we move forward. So what are some of the kind of you know, macroeconomic uh, geopolitical trends that that are um, kind of driving our concern about security of supply of mineral commodities uh, and, and, uh, and, and um, uh, I think amplifying the importance of what we're doing. Well, uh, in some ways, the, the kind of levels of production that we're seeing are historically unprecedented. So here's an example using iron ore. This is from our historical data series going back to the year 2000. This is world production of iron ore here. And you've got in red Australia, and then you've got Brazil and China, the big producers. The U.S. is basically flat here. But the, the growth in the production of iron ore over this period of time and the absolute volumes that are being produced are 
are, are staggering. Uh, there's, there are more than two billion tons of iron ore being produced annually every year. Uh, I, I'm quite confident that that's never occurred in human history before. Uh, so, and, and so you see the, the very rapid ramp up of, of uh, production capacity in countries such as Brazil and, and, and Australia to support that. And uh, so the growth has been very rapid, has been dominated by China, and we anticipate that, that there will be continued demand growth for the rest of the world, for reasons I will talk a bit more about in a minute. But if you look at some of the numbers, uh, world production is up by 140% over this period of time. The uh, uh, production volumes in Australia have grown by a factor of five, Brazil by a factor of two, and in China by a factor of four. So, you know, it's been basically flat in, uh, uh, in Europe, Russia, elsewhere, uh, iron ore production. So where's all of this iron ore going? Well, it's going pretty clearly into the Chinese steel industry, which leads to observations such as this, which uh, is that in the years of, of the 21st century, from 2000 to 14, China has produced as much steel, about 7 billion tons, as the U.S. did in the entire 20th century. So the, the scope of development and consumption of mineral commodities in China is absolutely enormous, and it has uh, impacted the entire rest of the world and, and the way uh, we view um, our, uh, our supply situation and vulnerabilities to uh, potential disruption in supply. It's impossible to overstate how important this is. What happens in China impacts the entire rest of the world, and so it's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. So what is, what is behind this? Well, People normally think about this in terms of uh, population growth, and it's not just population. I mean, China had a very large population long before they became the largest producer and consumer of a whole range of mineral commodities. It really is about middle class uh, living standards and the migration of people to middle class uh, uh, living standards. So there was a study that was published uh, some years ago now where they were projecting that between 2009 and 2000. Uh, 20, 000, uh, 2030, that as many as 3 billion additional people globally could be moving into what are considered broadly defined as middle class living standards. So with middle class ex expectations about smartphones and computers and automobiles and jet aircraft. Um, and really that big run up in, in uh, um, co commodity consumption that you saw as an example in the iron ore data was driven by literally hundreds of millions of Chinese citizens achieving middle class living standards. And uh, the, there are projections that, that this is going to continue with the largest increases being in, in, in the Asia Pacific region, so India, Southeast Asia, but also large increases in East Africa and elsewhere. Europe and North America and these projection, projections are, are basically flat or declining in absolute numbers and, and with a shrinking global share. So as these uh, 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 citizens from other countries increase their living standards, uh, we can expect that they're going to require a lot more uh, mineral consumption to, to meet their, their, uh, their needs. <clears throat> this is why we think in the long term that the, the, the kinds of uh, growth in demand, although maybe not at the same rates, are, are going to continue to be very large as we go forward. The other big thing that's happening is that technology is becoming much more complex. Right? So I think you know, most of us, uh, or at least some of us, can remember when, when mobile phones looked like this. Um, and they had far fewer elements that were in them in those days. Uh, smartphones have a lot more. And this is true of virtually all modern electronics. So they're, they're, the, the, the applications of material science are getting more and more specialized. Uh, and, and so elements that we never thought about using before, we are now using uh, in increasing quantities. Um, it's to the point where we are, uh, you know, uh, we are utilizing large fractions of the periodic table, whereas we weren't only uh, uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, and so this is w one of the reasons I always point to when people ask us, well, why do you cover all of these commodities? Well, we're using them all. Uh, and so uh, we need to know where we're going to get them from and, and whether we're going to continue to be able to get them. Uh, and, uh, it, and that's becoming increasingly important. <clears throat> so. Just as an example of the kind of work that we do for, for other uh, government agencies that relates to security of supply issues, so we work very closely with the Defense Logistics Agency, Strategic Materials. So these are the folks in the Department of Defense who are responsible for maintaining the national defense stockpile. 
So they, uh, they uh, do scenario analysis and evaluate various uh, conflict scenarios and what the impact would be on uh, the U.S. readiness to be able to meet such challenges. So we provide them very basic uh, foundational information that go into their models about uh, the latest uh, production capacities and, and production volumes for various countries. Uh, they put that into their models and they do their scenario analysis to do the annual material plan and the uh, biennial report to Congress on uh, their recommendations for how we adjust the national defense stockpile. But part of their mandate from Congress is, is in their definition of uh, strategic and critical materials uh, in the Stockpiling Act. And it is that part of it is that in the, these are materials that are not found or produced in the United States in sufficient quantities to meet such need. Um, so that leads us directly to a statistic that we report every year in the Middle Mineral Commodity Summaries, that is the net import reliance, which is basically you can think of as the amount of material that we import to meet our domestic consumption needs. So if we don't produce anything domestically, uh, whatever we consume is, is being brought in from outside, we are 100% net import reliant. The number of those materials has been increasing for decades. I'm going to show you some data on that in a minute. But this is what this chart normally looks like every year when it comes out in the mineral commodity summaries. This is difficult to read, but uh, you, many of you may have seen this. But we, if the bar is full, fully across here, we're 100% net import reliant, and it decreases as we go down. Uh, this is probably one of the most famous graphs that the USGS produces. Senator Murkowski has used this repeatedly in, in her uh, <coughs> comments to, uh, to her colleagues in Congress. And, uh, and so it's something that people look at very closely and, and uh, uh, anticipate coming out every year. <coughs> so a couple of key publications that <coughs> excuse me, you guys on the plane got me, I think. Um, <coughs> uh, a comparison of U.S. net import reliance going back to uh, 1954. <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to have to get a drink of water here because I'm going <coughs> to otherwise I have to just bear with me. I think I've got some in here. <clears throat> okay, that's better. Uh, so we did this a couple of years ago. Uh, 2015, we published this <clears throat> report on uh, U.S. net import reliance going back to 1954. <clears throat> and looking at 30-year slices uh, up to the year 2014. And then a second one on the assessment of uh, critical minerals that we did for the National Science and Technology Council in 2016. I'm going to talk about each of these <clears throat> in some detail. So here's what the, uh, the geographic distribution of import sources looked like in 1954. <clears throat> uh, and you can see uh, the categories here between 7 and 12 commodities coming from Canada <clears throat> for which the uh, U.S. Was, was greater than 50 percent net import reliant. <clears throat> Significant numbers also coming from Mexico, Brazil, South, Amer South Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. So it was a fairly uh, modest dependence on, on uh, imports uh, 60 years ago compared to the present day. Uh, and a lot of that material is coming from the Western Hemisphere. So Canada, Mexico, Brazil, uh, countries that, that share borders with us and trade relationships in the case of Canada and Mexico. And so, um, you know, from a security supply point of view, a fairly low risk. <coughs> If you uh, fast forward to 1984, you can see that <clears throat> we've got many more commodities that are now in the greater than 50% net import reliance category. <clears throat> we've got an entirely new category, 13 to 18 commodities coming from Canada, still our largest supplier. <clears throat> um, increase in the number coming from, from Mexico up to the 7 to 12 range. But then increasingly uh, coming from further uh, ab uh, abroad, <clears throat> much longer supply chains, what was then the uh, USSR, <clears throat> also China and Australia, as well as continued supply from South Africa. <clears throat> that was in the mid-80s. If you uh, fast forward to this century in 2014, the, the situation has deteriorated markedly uh, <clears throat> from this perspective. So we are now um, uh, have another, still another category of, of uh, number of commodities that we are greater than 50% net import reliant for. And this is kind of a threshold for us. 
So above that level, we're importing more than half of <clears throat> what we are consuming domestically relative to uh, what we're able to produce domestically. Um, <clears throat> and that's a kind of threshold that we look at to, to, uh, as, as a kind of trigger for things that we should start to be uh, more concerned about. <clears throat> but again, <clears throat> you know, con uh, considerable numbers of materials coming from the Western Hemisphere, but our, our um, dependence is now very clearly very global and particularly uh, dependent on China uh, to a degree uh, much larger than uh, we've ever experienced before. <coughs> so uh, to sum up the net import reliance piece, this is a long-term secular trend that, uh, toward increasing reliance on other countries for many of the middle commodities that are essential for our economy and national security. Supply chains are incre increasingly global with long logistics channels. Canada and Mexico remain major suppliers. This is important. <clears throat> this is a, is, a, is a way of mitigating our risk. Uh, the more materials we can get from Canada and Mexico, who are adjacent uh, nations and with whom we have long-standing trade relationships, the better off we are. The risks are inherently lower. So we should, I think, be a little bit careful about how we approach our relationships with our, our major trading partners <coughs> without getting too political. Um, China is the single largest supplier of many of these mineral commodities. And, and if, we think of, if we look at what happened in, in what we reported for 2016, the US is now greater than 50% net import reliant for, for 50 mineral commodities. This is more than half of the commodities that we, we cover. China is a major supplier for more than half of those. And we are 100% net import reliant for 20 of those 50. So, um, you know, I think by any objective measure, our reliance on um, <clears throat> mineral commodities from other countries has, has reached an unprecedented level, which is not in all cases uh, an indicator of risk, but it certainly can be a risk and is one of the reasons why we look very carefully at this and report this information every year and make sure that policymakers get this information because um, it, is, uh, it is a source of concern. I think also but the last bullet here is, <clears throat> for me, one of the most important. It's taken 60 years for us to get to this position and, and to think that we will somehow magically, uh, quickly or easily reverse this is, is magic thinking. I mean, it won't happen. It, mining just does not work that way. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, while we do need to, uh, I think, um, uh, do more to uh, encourage and enable domestic mining, we should not think that somehow it's going to very quickly change the situation. So there need to be other strategies that we adopt to help mitigate some of our risks. <clears throat> so the, this net import reliance immediately leads to, you know, consideration of, of um, <clears throat> some of the uh, ways that you can measure the risks that are associated with sourcing materials from one country or another. And the way we do it is to use the World Bank governance uh, indicators, the worldwide in governance indicators from World Bank. There are a series of six different factors by which they quantify the risks for various countries, so rule of law, political stability, et cetera. Uh, they sum those all up, take the geometric mean, and then they assign a score. So the red colors are, are, uh, are higher risk and the green are lower. So you can see for large parts of the world, there's lots of yellow, orange, and red, much more than we would like. We'd like things to be green, like Canada or Australia or, or the US. But much of the rest of the world is not that way. And so and in particular, you know, Central Africa, the Middle East is, is our, our hot spots for uh, uh, governance issues and have in, inherently higher risk if you are depending on those countries for uh, significant quantities of materials. So China is sort of in the middle of that range. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in any case, this is a metric that we can use to uh, uh, weight our uh, uh, measures of concentration of production to make a supply risk metric. And that's what uh, we've done uh, in, in, in some of our modeling. Uh, to, to look at a specific example of what this means, uh, we can look at tantalum. We had a, task, a tantalum task force a couple years ago uh, because of um, interest from the US Congress. Uh, the House and Senate were, were both asking questions about tantalum. Um, the Defense Logistics Agency was uh, being, uh, had an inquiry from GAO. We're also on here, so GAO is interested. DLA was interested. 
Uh, and they were asking questions about whether the U.S. government was doing what it should or was properly evaluating the risks to uh, the uh, supply of talent in the United States. And so uh, we, we uh, looked in detail at this issue uh, and, and published uh, three papers on this. You might wonder, well, why are we interested in tantalum? <clears throat> if you have a smartphone, you have some tantalum with you. Right, so tantalum is, as it turns out, uh, from a material science perspective, very good at being a capacitor, and capacitors are in every electronic circuit there is. Uh, and, and because tantalum is a very good material for this, you can make the capacitors very small, which is quite handy if you need to have a very powerful electronic device on your belt. Um, and so uh, tantalum is, is in virtually every electronic circuit uh, that we, we use these days. Um, and if you look at the supply situation for tantalum, going back to the year 2000, uh, through 2014 in this, uh, in this publication. What you see is that at the turn of the century, the bulk of production was actually coming from Australia and Brazil. That's the blue and red here. But the, the production in Australia has dropped off dramatically since then. And since about 2006, supply had began to be dominated by the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. So this is why... Um, in part, the Senate and the House were interested in this. These are Dodd-Frank countries. Uh, I, when I came to USGS, I didn't know that USGS had anything to do with Dodd-Frank. I thought it was about transparency in banks, which it mostly is. But there's a section in Dodd-Frank, next to the last one, I think, uh, that says uh, transparency also applies to mineral supply chains, particularly those uh, surrounding the Democratic Republic of Congo, and that companies that are sourcing materials from those areas need to to uh, do due diligence on their supply chain to ensure that they're not getting materials from armed groups, which are controlling much of the production there. But uh, th there's been a big shift over this period of time. This is a period of only 14 or 15 years, where we have gone from supply being dominated by Australia and Brazil to just supply being dominated by Democratic Republic of Congo and other African countries, where there's significantly higher uh, governance risk, as we saw here. <clears throat> and uh, we've gone from an industrial mining so, uh, and, 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 and uh, transparency of supply chains to artisanal mining and lack of transparency in supply chains. So there's a big change in, in the production of this material over a period of 15 years <clears throat> that has led to significantly higher risk. Tantalum's widely regarded as a critical mineral. The U.S. is 100% that import reliant. So these are the kinds of trends that we need to be monitoring to understand what's happening in, in the global supply in order to be able to evaluate uh, whether we are at risk to a disruption of the supply that could be quite damaging to our economy or national security. <clears throat> so the second of these key publications, as I mentioned before, is a report that was written principally by uh, people in my center uh, with some help from Department of Energy, but it was written for the National Science and Technology Council of the uh, for the Subcommittee on Critical and Strategic Mineral Supply Chains. Um, <clears throat> and this basically uh, describes the development of a screening methodology we developed to try to evaluate the trends in our mineral information data to see if we can identify uh, behavior that suggests that we could have a supply risk emerging. Um, so here's the kind of output that we get from this model. So what you're looking at here is a uh, a periodic table that basically shows a time series going back to the mid-90s through, at, at this point, 2013. We've got 2014 data in here now. We're, we're about to put in 2015 data. But these are a criticality indicator, which is a, a sum of a number of different components, which I'll show you in a moment. I'm not going to get into great detail on that, but you, you can see as you go back in time or you go forward in time uh, for your favorite element, so peaks and, and valleys in, uh, in criticality as measured by these metrics. And so each of these trends is telling us something about what was happening with supply and demand of, for those materials uh, as we go forward in time. So we believe that by looking at these um, trends and tracking these uh, trends, and, and we are uh, ideally situated to do this because we produce this information every year as part of our normal product cycle. And, and so we can, uh, we can set up these models and we can update them every year and uh, try to identify emerging supply risks from this. So we've done this for virtually all of the materials that we cover, or at least most of them. 
For some things, we've got more information than others. For, so for example, for copper, we can do it at the mine level, we can do it at the smelter level, we can do it at their level of refining. We can do ferro alloys, uh, which is another uh, uh, important set of commodities we cover. And then we've got some that are, that are basically just minerals. Uh, potash, uh, for example, the rare earths are here. Um, but uh, so we're, we're covering uh, much of the, the periodic table that we cover as a normal co course of uh, our, our work and, and uh, using that information in this model to try to anticipate problems coming in the supply chain. So here's what this looks like for rare earths. The early warning screening tool application to rare earths. There are three different components to this. One is the supply metric, which is basically country concentration times the governance risk. So I showed you the governance risk from the World Bank, uh, World Governance Indicators. Country concentration is simply the, the, uh, the fraction of production that is in a particular country. So if, uh, for example, for rare earths, um, uh, China is producing 90%, then the, the country concentration is going to be very high. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so then there's a demand metric that, that tracks uh, sort of total, total global consumption, and then a price metric that basically looks at price volatility. And then we roll these all up into a single metric for the criticality uh, indicator and take the geometric mean of these components, and, and that's the criticality uh, indicator. So if you look at this, what we would say is the following. <clears throat> all, going all the way back to, to the mid-'90s and up until you know, the turn of the century, this metric for supply risk was steadily increasing for rare earths. And so if we were watching, if we were monitoring this commodity using these metrics, that should have been a, a signal to us that something is changing pretty radically that we need to be aware of and potentially do something about. Right? We didn't. Uh, and in 2010, we had a shock from China where they uh, after a territorial dispute with, uh, with Japan, uh, threatened to cut off the supply of rare earths. Price spiked up. Everybody uh, got in a frenzy. Uh, but you, know, you could see this kind of behavior in, in these metrics for the supply risk and for the price risk. Actually, price was, was, was trending upward well before the, the crisis actually occurred. So we believe that if we are tracking these things, we can see behavior that could indicate that we have an emerging supply risk and that uh, these are useful metrics for us to track in order to, to be able to anticipate those. <coughs> so here's the, is the, uh, the famous rare earth story in terms of production volume. So the US used to be the major producer. This is Mountain Pass. We were to talk about that this afternoon. But then the Chinese uh, started to come in, uh, and so uh, in the, uh, the mid-'80s, uh, and are now the dominant um, <coughs> producers of rare earth and are, and are, are uh, very uh, deliberately um, uh, uh, moving in the direction of controlling the entire supply chain. As we had uh, Mountain Pass coming back in in the wake of the, um, the uh, crisis in 2010, but they've sen since stopped. Uh, I understand that they may, may be starting up again, having been purchased. But um, you know, the, the uh, mix of rare earths at, at uh, at Mountain Pass is not ideal for the, the kinds of things that we really need. There is ne neodymium there, but there's very little dysprosium or pr uh, uh, praseodymium, which are uh, important in magnets as well as neodymium. So uh, we really need um, additional rare earth um, capacity to come online in order to mitigate this very large uh, production concentration in China that <clears throat> is, uh, is a very clear risk to uh, uh, materials that are absolutely essential for a whole range of different technologies and of, of commercial and uh, national security use. So some other things that, that we could look at. So here's the rare earth story. And, and so this dip down, we just point out, OK, this, is, this reflects uh, Mountain Pass and, and Linus coming on online. If we extended uh, this out with, with additional data, we'd see this start to trend back upward. Although Linus is basically stabilized their operations in Australia after some rough years uh, economically. They are being supported uh, actively by the Japanese, uh, who are determined to uh, diversify their supply of rare earths. Um, but the interesting thing about uh, the Linus uh, production is that it, it's, it's mined in Australia. It goes to Malaysia to be processed uh, into concentrates. But a lot of that material is actually flowing into China to be made into metals and other compounds. You know, other, there are other flows going to Japan. but. 
because um, China dominates uh, the mining and concentrate uh, processes for rare earths, they have also started to dominate metal production and compound production. Uh, they are increasingly doing the research that's required to uh, fuel advances in those technologies. And so it's not enough to just be able to mine and concentrate minerals. You've got to think about the rest of the supply chain. And this is something that we are increasingly focusing on in, in the NMIC with our U.S. government agency partners, uh, the uh, uh, Defense uh, Agency and uh, Department of Defense and the intelligence agencies are, are particularly interested in this. And we are working with them on that. Um, so we have bismuth, where, uh, which is commonly, uh, more and more uh, commonly used as a, as a replacement for lead. Uh, and this, this ramp up is, is, is uh, clearly related to increased production concentration in China. <clears throat> then uh, cobalt, which is uh, an element of a great deal of interest for lithium ion batteries. It's one of the uh, most common elements that are, that are needed for cobalt and is likely to be um, come in much higher demand, and most of it is coming from Democratic Republic of Congo again, which, as we said before, is, has clear governance, governance issues. So this is one that we are watching very closely and that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you see tantalum spiking up here as well. Uh, so uh, we are, we are going to be updating these, these numbers every year and, and using them to um, try to anticipate and, and uh, um, alert people in Congress and, and other decision makers to what we perceive as being emerging risks uh, and hopefully um, get people to, to actually do something. Uh, my, my sense is that um, there is a greater interest in that now because some of these things are becoming obvious uh, that uh, they are uh, increasingly, um, that we increasingly are at risk and that we need to uh, uh, have uh, mitigation strategies for how we would, would cope with these risks. So just to sum up, how are you using global trends in, in mineral commodity supply chains? <clears throat> so we have we've been able to identify trends and factors that, that affect uh, the uh, supply and demand of mineral commodities on a range of different time scales uh, with a range of different metrics. Um, using time series analysis uh, is a very useful tool for screening over a broad range of mineral commodities to identify potential emerging supply risks. Uh, uh, th that in itself does not mean that they are critical. Just because they pop up on our metrics doesn't mean they're critical minerals. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we are, um, I think, um, been pretty clear with people, although people don't always accept it. Uh, people want us to produce lists, okay? They want a list of critical minerals. In our view, lists have some utility, but uh, a, a list of critical minerals really depends on who's asking the questions. So if you're Halliburton, uh, you probably think barite is a critical mineral. If you're General Electric, you probably don't think barite is very critical at all. If you're Department of Defense, you've got a completely different list. So um, we believe that in order to really understand whether something is critical and represents a supply risk, uh, we need to do follow-up studies to really understand the factors driving the changes in the metrics we see. So just having a high number on a metric on some model doesn't mean that it's a supply risk. So deep dive studies as follow-ups are really what allow us to, to uh, determine that. And again, we are, I think, uniquely suited to do that kind of work because we have experts in commodities and countries that work in our center that can really do that analysis. We have that capacity in a way that very few others uh, do. <coughs> Um, uh, I say that for a number of reasons. One, our coverage is, is very broad in terms of the commodities we cover. Um, uh, our scope is global, and uh, if you looked at those um, net import reliance uh, charts, <coughs> it's, it's pretty clear why we have to have a global scope. Um, we can do country-specific analysis, so we can analyze things from the perspective of the United States. We can also analyze things from the perspective of uh, competitors or potential adversaries. Um, our data are authoritative. They are widely viewed as the gold standard globally. Uh, everywhere I go and speak, people come up to me and say, we use your data all the time. And then they say, can we get it faster? <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, we've done something to, to, to make that possible. We are, we are getting uh, data, at least, out uh, quicker. The, the publications that accompany them are, are still slow, but that's another matter. Uh, 
It's important to do this in a dynamic way. Uh, you know, mineral criticality is not static. And a lot of the studies that have been done have been a snapshot in time, uh, but things change markedly over time. We've, we're now in the third annual cycle of doing this kind of analysis, of the screening analysis. And in the second year, the, the uh, uh, cycle, second year, we, we were able to demonstrate that you can, you can detect statistically significant changes year on year using these metrics. Uh, and what we've seen so far, usually we can trace back to um, changes, significant changes in production of, in a commodity that is highly concentrated in a, in a particular country. So if you, you have something that's very highly concentrated and you get a significant change in production, it shows up very clearly in our metrics. And so the sensitivity is something that we've evaluated and are, are starting to get a better, better feel for. Um, but it is dynamic, and it needs to be done uh, uh, on, 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 on some kind of schedule. The Europeans are doing theirs every three years. We are doing ours every year. <clears throat> we, want to, we want to look at trends. We, we don't, I mean, people want lists, and we'll give them a list if they want a list. But we are really look, focused on trends, because we think it tells us a lot more than just making a list. And, and our model seeks to balance uh, rigor. That is, we need to have metrics that are actually telling us something significant that relates to some physical reality, with the availability of data. So there are lots of complicated metrics that you can use to evaluate criticality, and people have used them. But if you can't get data for a broad range of materials, they're of limited utility. And so it has to be uh, rigorous enough so that you're getting, a, you're getting a signal that's real, but you need to be able to get the data, which means it needs to be readily available. And, and our data, uh, which we produce every year, are that. And so. Uh, we believe that that's another reason why we are uniquely suited to do this kind of work. So the kinds of data we're talking about are the net import reliance statistics that we, that we produce and that we are now building in directly to this model. Uh, production country concentration, so the, the kind of data I showed you for tantalum, for uh, uh, the shift from, uh, from Australia, Brazil to, uh, to Central Africa. Uh, and then growth in world production, price volatility, and then the world governance indicators that we get from World Bank. But all these ones in green, we actually report every year. We don't, we don't collect all of that information ourselves. Price volatility, for example, we, we subscribe to publications that, that track price. We consolidate that data. and We report averages uh, uh, for, uh, on an annual basis. Uh, but uh, uh, we do publish that information all in one place. Uh, it's in the public domain, so it's available and transparent for people. And uh, we've used it to good effect, I think, for, uh, for our modeling efforts. So with that, I will stop. I think I'm about on time. It's uh, uh, time for questions, I think. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to ask people to please go to the microphones. I think you all know the drill. Should be on Mitch. Can you check to turn on the <coughs> floor mic? This one, and it's on. <coughs> Pardon the frog in my throat here. Okay. First, China. Do they just have more from a geological perspective of lots of these minerals than other places? Or are they doing a better job of taking advantage of it? And number two, I'll have to ask them both first. The second one is Afghanistan. There was a big news story a couple of years ago about how they were going to be at this major concentration and you know ability to produce. They might not even have the stability to do it. But how does that? Is that? Is there any update on that? And does that factor into these uh, commodities that you're talking about? Okay. So first, China. Um, <clears throat> China is, is uh, for most, uh, for many of the materials we're interested in, is the largest producer uh, as well as consumer. Um, China is obviously uh, well endowed with mineral resources, but so is the United States. Right? I mean, China has chosen to develop their mineral resources. In many cases, they're doing it in an unsustainable way, in our view. Uh, and I think even their government is, is recognizing this and, and recognizing that it cannot continue. Uh, so you see, you think, for example, like iron ore. Um, the grade of iron ore in China is like you know 20 percent. Uh, you can dig iron ore out of the ground in Brazil; it's you know, greater than 60, uh, and, and in Australia as well. So they are increasingly purchasing their iron ore from Australia and Brazil. Uh, so they're not going to continue to mine iron ore that's 20 percent grade. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, 
and it's true for a lot of other commodities. But they, they have a, a very rich mineral endowment. Uh, they have chosen to exploit that. The United States has a very rich mineral endowment, and we have, uh, for the last 60 years, moved away from exploiting our domestic mineral resources, um, and it's resulted in, in very large import dependence. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't reverse it, but I, as I said before, it will not happen quickly. Um, Afghanistan uh, has a lot of potential, again, uh, and uh, is back in the news. Um, and in fact, uh, we've been asked recently by USAID to, to revisit Afghanistan. A lot of the work was done there. It was sponsored by the Department of Defense uh, some years ago now. Uh, in recognition of the fact that, you know, if there's ever going to be an end to the war in Afghanistan, they need to have some kind of economy. Uh, so we will be re revisiting Afghanistan. They have a lot of potential. They have a lot of issues, obviously. Uh, it's not enough to just have mineral resources. You've got to be able to mine them and get them out of there, and the infrastructure is, is very bad. The security situation is very bad. But um, presumably that's not going to continue forever, although... If you go back to Alexander the Great, you could probably argue that it's been that way for, for quite a long time in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, uh, we, we will be revisiting that uh, and, and uh, hopefully getting some funding from USAID to do that. Maybe somewhat a similar question with it. So we saw over the last 60 years that the trend was for the mineral supply to move from Canada to Mexico to, uh, to the Soviet Union and China. Are there any more general trends that have driven that uh, besides just the fact that uh, China is aggressively uh, developing their resources? Well, I think, you know, for, for the, um, the U.S., I mean, we, we have by far still the world's largest economy, or at least in nominal GDP. Um, and so our resource needs are large. And uh, since, particularly since the 70s, and I, you know, I, not, I don't want to make a political statement here, but when, when we implemented environmental laws um, in the United States uh, and the rest of the world you know, didn't necessarily follow along, it, it was kind of had the natural effect of pushing a lot of that uh, activity uh, to other countries. Um, and, and so that clearly, and I, I, I can't quantify that, but clearly since the 70s, there's been an acceleration in our dependence on uh, um, mineral uh, materials mined from other countries. Uh, that is, is clearly part of this uh, part of this uh, issue. Um, I mean, I, I think that, um, uh, from my perspective, that um, uh, when we say uh, we're not going to mine uh, materials domestically that we need, um, we're going to let some other country do that, and maybe some other country that doesn't have the same standards we do, and not doing it in a sustainable way. That we are being a little bit hypocritical, to be honest. Uh, we're going to. We don't want to get our hands dirty because you know, people don't like mining. So we're going to have it done over here. Uh, um, I think we're kidding ourselves that we're doing something good uh, from, the, from the bigger picture. Um, I don't think we are really. Um, it, and I think you could argue that uh, it would be better to do mining in jurisdictions where they have the rule of law, where they have environmental regulations, where the mining is being done sustainably. And Canada and Australia in large measure are doing that. Right? So, can be done, could be done here too. We've chosen not to. No. This may be a loaded question, but okay. um, <laughs> a couple years ago when I was doing research on my book, I spoke with Dudley King North. Mm -hmm. And he said at that time the estimate for the black market was anywhere from 25 to 60%. Um, since you obviously incorporate economic data and rely on other sources for some pricing, how do you factor the black market in. We do not. Since I've, you don't at all. <laughs> <laughs> we, we report, the real earth numbers we report from China are the official numbers. We, you know, we know that, that there's uh, illegal mining in China. Dudley, I think his rec most recent es estimate is 40% of heavy rare earth production is, is, is probably illegal. It might be more than that. Um, but we can't, as a government agency, say that 40% of, you know, heavy rare earth mining in, in China is, is illegal. We just are not going to say that. Um, it's in, this, in much the same way that you know, pe people have asked me why we have uh, a number for reserves in Canada for copper that is X. And the answer is because that's the Canadian government's estimate of what the reserves are for copper in Canada. We're not going to publish something that is contrary to you know, the government, uh, official government report from, uh, from another government. Um, other people will report, uh, you know, uh, other things, and, and they're free to do that. But uh, you know, we are a government agency, and we have to be uh, 
cognizant of our, our role and our responsibility. So we're not going to uh, we're not going to comment on on uh, uh, you know how much of uh, rare earth. Uh, uh, production in China might be illegal in our official publications. I mean, everybody knows that, that it's going on. It's, it's been widely reported and it's in any number of publications, but not in, not in ours. I, I think that's essentially my question. In the, how comfortable are you with the transparency and reliability of, of the data, both from countries and for corporations that clearly have strategic perspectives that might not want to, you know, show their hand for various reasons and, and yet we're, anyway, so uh, yeah. how, how does that enter into your... Well, that's a very, that's a very uh, good question and it's a very important aspect of what we do. I mean, uh, the, the, the data we collect domestically is from direct canvassing of, of U.S. producers. Right? They don't have to comply, they don't have to reply to our inquiries, but um, they do typically, if, if it adds value for them. It's very different for uh, information we source from other countries. And so we rely on a wide variety of different uh, kinds of information, uh, you know, our connections with uh, other government agencies, uh, people with, uh, from the U.S. that are on the ground in other countries, such as embassy staff, uh, private, the private sector. So we, we try to collect information from as many different sources as we can. It's in, in many ways, that part of our mission is, is akin to intelligence gathering. You, know, you have lots of different inputs and you have to sort of uh, decide uh, based on uh, the expertise of our specialists what um, our best estimate of, of those quantities are for countries where the information is, is less than transparent, which is for many of them. Another thing that we do often is send people on the ground uh, of some countries, you know, I'm not going to send my people to because the security situation is, is not, uh, does not allow it. but. Um, we had, for example, um, our, one of our Africa specialists was in the DRC and in Rwanda uh, w within the past couple of years to talk to traders and, uh, and other people that are uh, involved with the material flow of tantalum, in particular out of, out of uh, the DRC. So we, we, we rely on a whole range of different sources, and we do the best job we can to evaluate that information and, and, and make our best estimate. Uh, we also rely heavily on trade data, which are, because they're commercial, more readily available. Uh, that has its limitations too. Well, tantalum, for example, is lumped in with niobium often because they're often associated in the, in the mined product that, that people get those materials from. Um, but, uh, but that's another good source of information that is more transparent, right? Trade flows, even if a country is not very good at recording their trade flows out, if it comes into the US, we're pretty good at recording it, as are most people. Um, so the major trade flows are, I think, are, are reasonably well defined and, and are a good source of information for us. Not to uh, drag you into politics, uh, I've been reading a great deal for two weeks or so about uh, uranium situation and uh, the uranium one deal as though this were some national security emergency, though I certainly can't see why. And uh, I wonder if you could speak a bit about the uh, uranium supply situation. Yeah, um, we don't actually cover uranium, so I'm going to dodge the political question. Uh, we, we cover non-fuel minerals. Um, there uh, are people in USGS that, that work on uranium. Uh, and so I don't really know a lot about the domestic uh, supply situation for uranium. I think most of what we are getting for domestic consumption is actually coming from Canada, which is not particularly con of concern, uh, I don't think, uh, assuming that we you know, maintain civil relations with our neighbor to the north. Um, uh, so I, I really can't comment on, on uh, you know, the domestic supply for uranium. I, I, we do not perceive that as a, as a big risk, though, but, but others may. No. Yes? Uh, I noticed that uh, you talk a lot about things not being mined in the United States, mm -hmm. but there are, minerals are not evenly distributed. So how many of these things that we import are not available in the United States in significant quantities at all? <clears throat> Probably very few, to be honest. Uh, and, and to some extent, we don't really know. This is why the Senate has asked us to do this report about what we do know uh, and identify things that we don't know about that we need to, 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 uh, to, to study, to do resource assessments for. Uh, but <clears throat> there, there, I, I'm almost certain lots of uh, mineral potential in the US that we still don't know about, particularly in Alaska. Um, and it, it's a matter of, of, res, uh, of uh, doing resource assessments for those materials. The other aspect of that is that 
A lot of the materials that, that we are most concerned about are produced almost entirely as byproducts. Um, and so they would be uh, potential byproducts for major commodities such as copper or nickel. Uh, we really haven't done a very good job of evaluating what the potential are for those kinds of materials. Also, there are significant byproduct uh, uh, mineral concentrations with precious metals. So, um, and there is a lot of focus on precious and, and base commodity metals. So um, that's part of, uh, I think, a, an important part of what we're, we need to do in the next 10 years or so is, is to really understand better what the potential is uh, for domestic mining and, and, uh, and identify the, the most uh, uh, interesting areas that, uh, uh, then that the private sector can then go and, and, and uh, develop. Do you see any evidence in the current Congress or in the administration that would give you some evidence that they would, that some, that the United States will eventually have to reduce the need for imp imports and have more internal building of this equipment, this commodities? Okay, so I'm going to be careful not to make yeah. any political statements here. <laughs> I, know. Uh, I think certainly um, I can say that uh, there is a, um, a heightened interest uh, in the new administration in um, natural resource issues. I mean, they're particularly are focused on energy, as you're probably aware, uh, and energy on federal lands, but also, I think, uh, minerals as well. I think um, certainly, um, I, I think the Secretary of the Interior understands that, that issue pretty clearly uh, and, uh, and thinks that it's important. Um, and so, um, and there certainly are people in Congress, uh, Senator Murkowski, uh, chief among them, but also people in the House who have for years now been uh, uh, trying to um, prod our government in the direction of doing something to make it uh, a little bit easier to develop mineral resources in the United States. Uh, Senator Murkowski has been introducing a legislation for several years now. Uh, um, and uh, she has a bill again in this, uh, in this uh, Congress uh, that actually, I think if it were brought up, could, could pass because it, it has pretty broad support, bipartisan support. It's got a lot of things in it that, um, that a lot of people agree uh, on, um, and it involves both energy and minerals. So there's some chance that uh, I think uh, that we are going to start to make progress on this. I think it's, uh, it's clear to many people, myself included, that, you know, um, that it's time for this to happen. Whether it will or not, well, we'll have to see, but um, uh, because it does take so long to, you know, identify and uh, develop and put a mine into production, it's not like, you know, we've got a lot of time to waste, so it's either now or we're not going to get, we're not going to get there. Yes, next. What's next? I think. It seems like uh, you've done a lot of sophisticated, uh, you've done a lot of sophisticated modeling on the supply side, uh, and you mentioned in some cases the demand side. But do you have a similar depth of uh, information and modeling on the demand side for all of these materials? <clears throat> no, not not really. Um, and uh, there are two schools of thought on that. Uh, uh, we'd like to do more on the demand side, but the demand side is a lot harder to measure. We do report consumption every year. And we report, uh, you know, increases in consumption, um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, demand, particularly at a granular level, is is difficult, and it's very difficult to forecast. Um, and if I could predict the demand for mineral commodities, I would be a mineral commodities trader, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, making a gazillion dollars. Um, but uh, you can you can you can um, identify, and and, and I've, I've given talks on this before, because uh, people always want us to predict the future. Um, and I always say that I'm not very good at it. Uh, but you can look at broad sectors of the economy and, and say, okay, what do we really, what do we know we're going to need? Well, we need energy and we need, we're dependent on technology. We need to eat, right? So fertilizer minerals for agriculture, uh, for transportation, we, you know, electric cars are coming. So we know based on current technology that demand for lithium and cobalt and manganese and graphite are going to increase pretty dramatically in the next few years. So you can, you can look at those big trends and say, you know, these are the kinds of materials we know we're going to need. You look at people's projections about, you know, what fraction of the world's um, automobile fleet is likely to be electric cars by 2040 and get some idea about that. But it's more difficult and, and you're more likely to be wrong uh, in, in making those kinds of predictions. But we do the best we can. <laughs>
So my question is a little bit of a follow-up to uh, something that you briefly just talked about, which is that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the potential to mine these things in the U.S. And uh, recently I've been working with the USGS maps spanning from like the 30s until the 70s that are the oil and uh, minerals for fuel resources maps. Uh -huh. And uh, clearly that was an extensive effort and push to get all of those made. So I'm, I guess I'm just sort of curious what it would take to do something similar for some of these non-fuel resources. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty good question. And, and uh, you know, the uh, new associate director for energy and minerals at USGS has been pushing exactly um, uh, the kind of plan I think that you're talking about. It's called Three Deep. Uh, and it would uh, c complete geologic mapping of, uh, of the United States, which I think we've, we've mapped uh, at the scale that would be necessary for, uh, to, to guide uh, the private sector in, in developing mineral deposits, I think it's like 17 or 20 percent of the, the U.S. If you look at countries like uh, Australia and Canada, they, they have a, a much more extensive coverage. And, and, and because of that, you know, it's much, much easier for companies to make decisions about uh, developing mines in those countries. Um, but that would be coupled with uh, geophysical surveys that um, would give us uh, a, 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 the a third dimension in addition to the geology uh, over large sections of the U.S., particularly the western U.S. Uh, and so there's, you know, there's an initiative um, that's, you know, floating around downtown somewhere that would do exactly that. I think it would be like a, a five or ten year uh, effort, at least initially. Probably would take longer than that. Um, but uh, you know, certainly that is something that we can and should do. Uh, and, and that's not just, you know, USGS saying that. I mean, Congress has heard that from industry. I mean, they, they, there's been testimony on the Hill about that very subject. And, and uh, CEOs have told them that we just don't have the baseline information that Australia and Canada have, for example, countries that have very similar, you know, legal and, and environmental jurisdictions to us and that are successfully and sustainably developing their mineral uh, resources. Um, there, there are a number of other things that, uh, that we should do uh, that uh, directly involve, um, you know, support for USGS. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to ask for money, so uh, somebody, else will ha somebody else will have to ask for it. But, um, but uh, that is one initiative that, uh, that, that has been floated downtown and, uh, and is, is getting some traction. Hopefully we will see that come to fruition in, uh, maybe in uh, fiscal 19. Platinum is extremely important for many, many reasons, and the U.S. has virtually none. And I'm wondering about your what comments you might make about platinum. Platinum. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we do have platinum. Uh, Stillwater Complex is uh, is a pretty significant source of, of, of platinum group elements, and was just acquired by a South African company, Sabanye. Uh, uh, but it is considered by most uh, uh, analysts as, as a critical mineral, um, uh, in part because concentration of production is, is quite high in South Africa and Russia. Uh, and, you know, South Africa has is, is, uh, is clearly uh, had a lot of uh, issues uh, with governance uh, in the past few years. Their government is, is, is viewed, I think, as, as uh, uh, um, doing things that are not... Uh, very uh, supportive of the mining industry, and they've been heavily criticized for that. So it is a, a material that we are concerned about. We do have some domestic um, uh, capacity there, so uh, it's probably not at the top of the list, but um, it's clearly important going forward uh, in, uh, in something that we're going to have to keep tracking. You're a very minor producer of it, I believe. Yeah. We at least have some. And we have mining, uh, 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 mining operations, viable mining operations. So, <clears throat> which we can't say for some of the other materials we're, look, we're talking about. Yes, uh, I'm not quite an audience plant for this, but I'm getting the impression that you are very interested in domestic production, or at least examining it and wondering how we can approach it more responsibly, both socially and economically. Um, and environmentally, you keep mentioning Australia as a leader in this. Can you talk some about what it would take to develop mineral resources in a responsible way, which would avoid the not in my backyard sort of um, push to make it external? Yeah, I'm not sure I can uh, can answer that or solve that one. Um, uh, um, 
uh, it's, part of it is education. Um, uh, people, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we've sort of evolved to a society that is in many ways um, uh, detached from the um, physical um, requirements that support our standard of living, minerals, energy. I mean, we just don't, you know, people think that gasoline comes from a pump. Uh, and um, that you know the smartphone comes from from you know uh, Amazon.com or something. Um, so part of it is education, and that's you know we do a lot of that in USGS. I speak regularly to groups uh, about um, you know our raw material needs and, and how that relates to people's standard of living. Uh, uh, that even that is probably not going to convince some people um, uh, because people don't want to give up things, right? And 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 that really is what. You know, people if, who tell me that they don't want to mine, what they are saying to me is that I don't want to mine here. And so my immediate question to them is, well, what do you what do you want to give up in in exchange for not mining, you know, in our country or not mining at all? Um, you know, you want to give up your smartphone, you want to give up your car. What what is it that you want to give up? You can't you can't have all of these things without mining. And by the way, we can't have, for example, renewable energy without a lot of mining. Um, uh, I, I worked in the mining industry for a long time. I know mining can be done sustainably. Uh, you know, the mining industry today, the modern mining industry, is not the mining industry of 50 years ago, which is what a lot of people look at and say, you know, we've got all these legacy issues, um, and, and, and so we don't, want to, we don't want to do this mining. But there's really no escaping the fact that um, much of the extractive industries are you know, very disruptive. I mean, you have to dig, right? You have to dig holes, and, and, and you have to, you know, you produce materials that you can't use. But it can be done um, responsibly and sustainably, and companies are doing it. Uh, and increasingly, they are required to do it that way. And you have to, you know, you, you can't just uh, you know mine and then walk away from it and, and leave the legacy costs uh, for the for the society to to absorb. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, um, I think we just have to continue to try to make the case to people that, um, you know, if you want to have the things that you value uh, and that support your standard of living, then uh, we have to have mining, whether it's done here or somewhere else. Um, it has to be done, uh, and uh, there's really no escaping that. And, and then from my perspective, it's better to do it in a, in a, uh, a sustainable way than it is to, to, to push it off somewhere else where it's not going to be done responsibly. Uh, because you know uh, the people there will suffer because of that, and, and globally, uh, it's it's. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a net negative. But I, I don't have any easy answers um, uh, because it's, it's the kind of thing that, you know, that some people are just never going to accept. Uh, I, uh, I try not to be, sort of come off as you know, Mr. Minor, Mr. Industry Minor Guy uh, uh, because, uh, you know, we, you know, USGS is a fact-based scientific organization and, and we are trying to present the facts as, as best we can. But it is a fact that we depend on these materials, and increasingly we're not producing them ourselves. So if that's going to continue, then I think we're going to have problems. Uh, Steve, thanks. Um, very interesting talk, and Diane, uh, allow me to make one more question. Uh, your, your last response led me to wonder, are all these things single-use commodities? We're not talking about reusing our lithium, reusing these various commodities, they go into our landfill and then they're no longer available? Uh, I think um, of most things in principle can be recycled, many are not uh, these days. I mean, we've just done a study of tantalum to look at um, you know, the uh, global life cycle of uh, tantalum flow and, and very little of what's been mined is actually being recovered. Um, so we've got a lot more work to do on um, Recycling, uh, and again, you know, this is an area where the U.S. is well behind our, our allies. I've been to facilities in Japan where they are uh, developing technology to extract um, trace metals from electronic scrap, for example. People have been extracting uh, the precious metals for a while from those materials, but the uh, the trace metals that we're talking about, tantalum and other things, uh, uh, we don't have the technologies uh, for most of those. Uh, things like lithium, um, uh, you know, recycling of, of lead acid batteries is, is ubiquitous. I mean, they're almost all recycled. There's, a com there's at least one company in, in California that is, is recycling lithium ion batteries, and I expect that with widespread adoption of electric cars and lithium ion batteries, that those, those materials are going to get recycled. I mean, those are perfect uh, unit uh, uses of 
of materials that can readily be segregated in a waste stream and, and, and the materials recovered. So, uh, but there are commodities that, uh, that the U.S. Uh, uh, recovers significant um, portions of. I mean, for example, domestically, we get about half of our tungsten from recycling. So some things are, are easier and more readily recycled than others, and that's certainly part of the answer. Uh, uh, with uh, the anticipated growth that we expect uh, in, in global consumption, it's not going to be enough. You're still going to have to mine, but it certainly can contribute to uh, the global balance and, and, and in a very positive way. So we've got to work on the technologies to recover those things. And that in part means you know, learning how to design things in a way that allows them to be readily segregated at the end of life. Uh, if it's just too convenient to throw it away, then that's what's going to happen. But if you make it easier to recover those materials, then, then uh, it'll be economic to recover them and people will do it. <clears throat> Do you know whether the US, U.S. government invests in um, pilotite projects for res uh, mineral resources? For which, which projects? Um, mineral resources. Uh, mineral resources. I'm thinking specifically. I'm remembering the um, when the we um, when China cut off the rare earth uh, supply, and it took us some time to restart. A uh, mountain pass mine yeah. or other sources. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know that there are other uh, projects to keep open in a mothball state or pilotite state? Some From the government? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the government. None, none that I'm aware of. Um, although there is, a, there is a provision in procurement policy for the Department of Defense called Title III that would allow the Department of Defense to uh, get involved in projects that, for materials they viewed as particularly critical. As far as I know, they've only used it once. Um, that was for beryllium. Um, so they basically um, made an arrangement with Materion, a U.S. company that uh, mines beryllium in Utah, uh, to build a facility in Ohio that uh, makes high purity beryllium metal and beryllium compounds, which are essential for defense applications. So the De Department of Defense used this Title III provision to uh, basically ensure Materion that they would make a return on their investment. And so basically, if you build this facility, we will take a certain amount of this material at market prices. Uh, so there's a mechanism there. It's been uh, uh, very, uh, 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 has not been used extensively at all for materials, and maybe using it in other areas, it's a procurement policy. Um, but I know they are considering doing that for other materials. Um, and I think uh, it is one way that the government can take a more proactive role. Um, and you know, we are certainly you know, engaged with our, our US government agency partners to help them understand what the most critical materials are and the forms of those. And, and are happy to you know, advise them on that. That's really part of our role, is to, is to give um, the other agencies the facts they need to, to make those kinds of decisions. Yes? Could you, could you say more about the titanium? Tungsten recycling? I have no idea where, where, where it's yeah. used. It would well, so tungsten, the, the principal use in the U.S. is in tungsten carbide used in like drill bits uh, for hydrocarbon uh, drilling and, and other kinds of drilling. So um, there's a kind of closed loop there. You know, so when these wear down, the uh, materials get recycled back to the manufacturer and recovered and put into new uh, tungsten carbide for, uh, for more, mostly I, I think the, the, the major, major application is for drilling applications. Going right. once, going twice. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you so much. That was a delightful talk, and you all have to really thank him. He flew out from our Virginia office to give this talk. My pleasure. Thank you for all the great questions. Appreciate and thank that. you all for coming here. Hope to see you November 30th.